I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. We're in Woodstock, Georgia, on Wednesday, August the 20th, 2014, with our special guest, Garland Penholster, former member of the Georgia House of Representatives, legendary basketball coach, <laughs> successful businessman and one of the architects of the Georgia, modern Georgia, Republican Party. Welcome, Garland. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be with you. Ray City, Georgia. Yeah, my, my uh, birthplace. Uh, I was born at Ray City, the 12th child of 12 farm children. Uh, but it wasn't as chaotic as it might sound. Uh, those were the days when the young men finished uh, high school, they went to work. Those were the depression years in the 30s. Uh, so by the time I was in the fifth grade, we didn't have but three people, three, three of the children left at home. So it wasn't quite as bad as it, as it sounded. But uh, I was just born in Ray City. Actually, we moved to Clyteville when I was very young, before, before even starting school. So all of my teenage years, growing up years, all of my school years, secondary school and elementary school was in Clyteville. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I've been told that at one time there were three pinholster basketball players <laughs> on the same team. Yeah. Well, that's like, that's two and a half basketball teams. <laughs> well. That's true. My my older brothers all played basketball. Uh, uh -huh. We had a we had a dirt court. We did not have an indoor gym, and there were many schools like that in South Georgia because the weather allowed it. And where they got the clay, I don't know, but they brought in clay and made really clay courts. And we played other schools uh, inter interscholastic games on those clay courts. But 1939. Uh, we won the district Class C championship, and I had three brothers on that team. The whole team was made up of two families, the Zippers and the Penholsters. <laughs> there, were, there were three of each, and uh, they kind of rotated whether they had three Zippers or three Penholsters on the floor at any one time or not. <laughs> and the, uh, the coach was the principal of the school, and so when they made the state tournament after winning the uh, district tournament, it was in Winterville, just outside of Athens. Uh, they had no way to get there, so the principal agreed to take all five of them in his car at his expense, and they drove to Winterville, played a game, and came home. <laughs> that was a lot of, lot of driving. And obviously they lost, because they lost to a little Class C school close by that hadn't had to travel or anything. Yeah. So no substitute, five players and a coach. <laughs> Different time. Yeah. <laughs> Different. So, uh, Garland, after high school, you continued your basketball career. North Georgia College. Yes, yes. And you know how I selected North Georgia College? Because one of my older brothers had had a letter of uh, interest in him coming to play basketball at North Georgia College. They didn't give grant and aids. I assume they do now, but they didn't give grant and aids. I don't know why it stuck in my mind. I thought, well, they're interested in my brother. Maybe they'll like me, and I'll just go and walk on. And also, World War II uh, was in full sway, and I, I wanted to go in with a commission I felt like uh, that was a good goal. So I went to North Georgia College for those two reasons. I wanted a commission. And North Georgia doesn't, at that time, did not give a BA. If you graduated, you had a BS. You had enough science by the time you graduated. We were talking earlier about our old friend Jim Mentor, former editor of the Atlanta Journal. Jim was there two years with me, and then he went to the University of Georgia and, uh, and graduated there. Now, there may be some 
our good friends from the University of Georgia that won't like to hear this, but this is what Jim says. He says, I graduated from the University of Georgia, but I was educated at North Georgia College. <laughs> so that's a little vested interest yes. there. So, I, and I, I confess to it being vested. Yes. So after college, you went into the Army. Right. Served in the Army. Right. I went to uh, Fort Benning. I had been coaching high school ball for two years. Um, we had good success. We won the state championship our first year at Somerville. Went down to Rock Mart, and uh, we only had two coaches. I was the number two coach on the football team, and we won the state championship. I beat Valdosta on Cleveland Field in Valdosta, 56 to 16. So that was a pretty pretty good day's work there because you remember that was the heyday of Wright Bazemore and Palos right. had great great football. So I was kind of hooked. I had really wanted to go to med school, and uh, I kind of I kind of got hooked on coaching that that first year or two. Mm -hmm. and then I ended up at Fort Benning, and uh, quite by accident I, I ended up with a cushy job. This was during the Korean War. I didn't. Uh, I, I never did go to Korea. I actually had a very cushy job. I was an instructor with the infantry guidance school there inf at the infantry center. And I guess Fort Benning Infantry Center is one of the two or three top military training bases in the, in the nation. So I was very fortunate. I, uh, I had the sad duty of attending a lot of funerals of my classmates. Uh, the Korean War was uh, it was pretty bad on second lieutenants. The platoon it was, a, to my knowledge, it was the first war where the platoon leaders were right out front all the time. And the old uh, joke about the Korean War was every Monday morning they'd say, "Send us another sack of potatoes and another second lieutenant," <laughs> because they had been killed off. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to a lot of funerals of my classmates who had come through Fort Benning for a refresher course, and I had taught them in the refresher course, they were off to Korea and dead in no time. Korean War was a mean war. Mm -hmm. So after the Army, back to coaching? Back to coaching at Southwest Cab. Uh, and again, I coached uh, football as an assistant as well as uh, track. Uh, so. I, I feel it was, I was very fortunate in, in my coaching to have coached all of the sports at one time or another, and I was able to steal just a little bit from each one in terms of uh, application to, to basketball, which I subsequently got into at Oglethorpe University. So then uh, after Southwest DeKalb, didn't you go directly to Oglethorpe? Yes, yes. What uh, what convinced you to be a college coach? Oh, oh! I wanted to be a college coach. I, I was I was eager to be a college coach. Oglethorpe had, uh, I believe, 182 students at that at that point in time, and uh, was somewhat in dire straits. Uh, but I was happy to get the job. I, I wanted it. Uh, they didn't have a gymnasium. Uh, they didn't have uh, a basketball. Uh, they didn't have any players. So went there. Although had, they had played in a, uh, a few a few games, uh, more like extramural. They played some junior colleges and they played uh, uh, some uh, church schools. But actually, back in the 30s, they had a good basketball program. 1936, 1940, there were some great teams. And then in 48, 49, they had some good teams. But it had, uh, it had changed entirely in the program. Athletic program was almost defunct. So that's the way I started uh, there at Oglethorpe. And uh, it, was kind of, uh, it was kind of a lonesome job right by myself with the whole athletic program. Uh, I uh, felt like there was no interest in it to start with. But I, I started trying to build, and I found a fellow named Steve Smith. Steve Smith owned Dixie Seal and Stamp and played football at Oglethorpe. 
Oglethorpe was big in football in the late 20s and in the 30s. They, uh, they beat the university one year in football. They beat Georgia Tech one year in football. And of course, they still talk about that, you know. They don't, <laughs> they don't talk about the games they lost. <laughs> but uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't find any interest in basketball, so I started going to see the old football players and uh, formed a booster club with them. And some of them didn't know a field goal from a free throw. But they could see that we were trying to rebuild the program, and they got on board, came with me, and gave us some help. We got some, we got some ball players in, and one of them became the chairman of the board, of trustees, and he saw to it that we had a gym. If it hadn't been for him, we played on the road for three years. We we had no home gym, so we played on the road mostly at cross keys for the home games and then wherever anybody else wanted to play us. And we had a pretty good start even, even while we were playing on the road. We went eight and 12, 18 and six, 24 and one, those, those three years. And then, and then we got a gymnasium and our, our program really, really took off. Best year, 1963. That's, that was a, best year as far as record is concerned. <laughs> we, we had gone to Kansas City at the National NAI tournament one year, lost in the first game, and we did not perform as well as the team was. That was, that was a very good team. But 62 and 63, uh, I had uh, five lanky small town boys from various places, Kentucky and Georgia, and uh, they were all good students. Every, every one of them was a good student. They ranged in size from 6'3 and a half to 6'6. Every one of them had played high school center. Can you imagine moving a high school center to guard? <laughs> well, we played two high school centers at guard and two high school centers at forward and <laughs> one in the middle. Uh, and. Uh, that, that, team, that team did exceptionally well. As I recall, it uh, went to the semifinals of the NCAA Division II tournament right. in 1963. We did, we did. We lost to Wittenberg in that game in an overtime. Uh, Joe Dean, who used to do the SEC games on, on television, uh, before the game started, Wittenberg had a great reputation for being a good defensive team. We had that same reputation. We had led the nation in defensive uh, scoring uh, points uh, for four years. So Joe Dean said, if Oglethorpe and Wittenberg plays, it'll be two to one in 19 innings. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, we were 35 to 35 in the, in the full game. And they beat us in an overtime. But the next night, uh, those were the days when they played for third place. I don't think they play for third place anymore. But the next night, we played Southern Illinois for third place, and, and we beat Southern Illinois. So we were, we, were, we were still happy with our tournament. Well, then I think I've got to mention the fact that you coached the uh, United States team in the Pan American Games in 1963. Right, right. Uh, that stemmed from the fact that uh, the small colleges had selected me to coach the All-Stars in Kansas City. So I had the small college All-Stars in Kansas City in the Pan American Trials. Uh, we had on our team, there were only four teams there. It was AAU, uh, major college, small college, uh, who, who else? <laughs> we had four, it was four, there were four teams. I don't remember four of them right now. But I had, uh, I had such terrible talent on that team as Willis Reed from Grambling and Lucius Jackson from Pan American. <laughs> so even though we, we were small college all-stars, we weren't exactly small college. And, and so we, we whipped up on the, the major colleges, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, 
I, uh, I was selected to coach the Pan American team by the Olympic Committee that the, the night after the finals, I was told shortly after the game uh, that I would be the head coach of the Pan American team. And to my knowledge, I don't know that we've ever had another small college coach who got that honor, and it was a big honor. I was, mm -hmm. I was thrilled. I was 35 years old, and mm -hmm. uh, I was very, very thrilled with it. Well, you've been a very successful coach. Uh, obviously, you know a little bit about the game. In fact, you've written several books about the game. Yes, I wrote five. The 10 years I was at Oglethorpe, I was able to turn out one every two years. That was sort of my, my hobby. And I, I assume that most people remember the wheel uh, offense that we developed at Oglethorpe. But actually the book that sold the most was uh, Encyclopedia of Basketball Drills. George Allen had done a football book, drills book, two years before. All of those books were published by Prentice Hall, the sports division of Prentice Hall. And uh, each of them uh, sold more than 10,000 copies, which I think they considered that a successful book for coaching books. Uh, but the drills book sold over 100,000. Uh, it, it got translated into a number of different languages and picked up as, as the world was developing basketball teams. Yugoslavia and all the foreign countries were developing basketball then, and they all wanted a good drills book. So it was recommended by the State Department, and it so, sold a lot of copies. I got uh, royalties off of that for about 25 years, but they weren't huge, but they were very welcome <laughs> to a fellow in education. Uh, so, Coach, why did you leave coaching? Well, I had four, four daughters, very young, and at that point, none of them wanted to go to Oglethorpe. They could have gone to Oglethorpe uh, tuition free, but uh, naturally young people want to go away to college, and I could not see any way in the world that I could afford to send them. So I, I went into business. And uh, I've done a number of things since then, uh, but I never did anything that was as fulfilling as my 10 years at Oglethorpe with those young men. Uh, we are still friends. I had lunch yesterday with four of them. In September, I'll have lunch with about 25 or 30 of them and their wives. We do this three times a year. Uh, and that's after I, I finished in 1965, 1966. So many of them are in their 70s, late 60s. Uh, depends on the year that <clears throat> they played there. But that was the most fulfilling thing I ever did. I enjoyed everything I've ever done. Each each time I thought, well, this is the best job I ever had. You know, when I when I went into business and things were going okay, I said, well, this is the best job I've ever had. And then uh, when I got into uh, politics, I thought, this is the best job I've ever had. <laughs> but as I've gotten older and I don't have any job anymore, the thing that's the most satisfying to me is my ten years with those young men and at Oglethorpe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when did you first get interested in politics? Well, I got interested when I was about 45 years old. I was in the uh, supermarket business in Atlanta. I had two stores at that point. Uh, we later added some more stores, but at that point I had two stores. And some people approached me to run for the state senate, people in Atlanta who were active in the uh, Republican Party. And uh, a friend of mine came in the store who was Republican and in the state Senate. And I asked him, I said, uh, how many of the folks there can afford to be there uh, financially? Because they all have businesses and law practices and so forth. He said, maybe one, maybe kill Townsend. And I said, well, I don't believe I can afford it. And I didn't do it. But after uh, I got to, uh, to a little more comfortable stage of life. I was 60, and it was still something that interested me. I'd done a number of things, and I thought it would be a very interesting uh, project, and, and I ran in, at, in 60, at, at the age of 60. Mm -hmm. 
That was 1990. Yeah, yeah. First year, 1990. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Circle R Club. Circle R Club was a group of Republicans in North Fulton that uh, was kind of spearheaded by Paul Coverdale and many others. Bob Snow was an early one of, uh, of that group. Uh, we had just a few people, the old cliche at that time as far as Republicans with that Republicans could meet in a phone booth. Uh, and they almost could. There was a handful of us and, and, and we had Bob Dole to come down and speak to us. We, had, we could get almost any Republican on the national level to come and speak to us even though we might not have over 50 people there, and plus wise 50 couples we'll say. And you could be a member of the Circle R. All you had to do was spend a hundred dollars and pay the dues, and you were you were a member. We were happy to have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's talk a minute about your legislative career. You uh, you began serving in 1971. Uh, what was on your mind? No, 1991. I'm sorry, 1991. Uh huh. Uh, what was on your mind when you went to the legislature? Well, if you're, you're talking about issues I might be interested yes, in. Yes. Yeah. Well, as a small businessman, when I was in the supermarket business, it seemed to me like every law that was passed hit the small businessman one way or another, cost him money. So I was more interested in, uh, in the economy and, and those fiscal matters. And I went with, a, with two, two primary goals as far as legislation. One was uh, to cause the budget to be created in a zero-based manner so that each year, rather than just tacking on to what we spent last year, uh, we would go back and start from zero and have each department build their own budgets. I think they've now passed that. I believe, I believe that's now being passed, but that was, that was my one of my first issues. The second one was uh, I grew up at a time when there were no lawsuits to speak of. I, I had never heard of a lawsuit in my county where I was raised in Lowndes County in South Georgia. I'm sure there were some, but out at Clydeville we didn't know about lawsuits and anybody that talked about bringing a lawsuit was frowned on. They were, they were uh, they were not upstanding people, and it, uh, I guess that uh, colored my thinking about litigation, and I, I wanted to uh, bring some tort reform that would cut down on frivolous lawsuits. Uh, I had a bill to do just that, to cap any gain on a lawsuit at $250,000, and if you brought a lawsuit and you lost, to let you pay for it all the lawyers' fees and the court costs and everything else. I felt like that would cut down on frivolous lawsuits. Naturally, I didn't get it passed. The, uh, the attorney's <laughs> lobby was a little too strong for me. And, but we got it heard and got it to committee, almost got it out of committee, never did get it out of committee. But somebody else took my zero-based budget idea and, and got it passed later on. Those were, those were my primary issues. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm very proud of a very small bill that I got passed. That was a state wildflower tag. Uh, this was a, a bill to create a tag with a wildflower symbol on it and pay an extra $25, which would go strictly into the wildflower program up and down our state highways. Mm -hmm. And you had a pretty, wooden, pretty good one on 575 at one time going up uh, toward uh, Young Harris and so forth. I thought it would make people enjoy traveling in Georgia a little bit better, and I enjoy it myself. I'm a gardener, and uh, I enjoy the flowers. I'm sorry to say that that program hasn't been executed as well as I had envisioned. Uh, every time I've checked on the wildflower fund, there's at least a half million dollars in it, and uh, nobody's ever explained to me why that half million dollars isn't being spent because that was what it was what it was for. Right. But we got a few patches, wildflowers around, but I, I think it could be extended greatly. Okay, 
So you were a Republican in a very Democratic controlled House of Representatives. Uh, didn't you find it very difficult to get bills passed? It could not have been more Democrat than, than you said. It was very controlled. It, it was, it was uh, very lopsided. You couldn't get a bill passed. You couldn't get a bill heard in committee. Uh, if, if the speaker really didn't want your bill to get heard, he'd kill it at, at the committee. And if he didn't kill it at the committee, if you did finally get it out and get it on the floor, you would lose it there. It was very difficult. I had one very interesting experience, though, that I'm very proud of. I had a, little, a small tort reform bill. I told you I was interested in tort reform. I had a small bill that would uh, uh, el eliminate any uh, liability on the part of a doctor who ran out onto an athletic field to assist an injured player. Uh, you have seen that happen, and I didn't know that those doctors were liable when they did that. But I found out, found out that they were, so I brought a little bill to eliminate uh, their, their uh, liability on that. And you know who my second signer was? I was a, I was a freshman, didn't know any better. I went to Denmark Groover, the whip of, of the Democratic Party. And he was a little startled when I asked him to be the second signer because freshmen just didn't do that and certainly not Democrats. But he said, I'll sign that with you, Garland. And he did. And then I was pretty green and didn't handle it well from the well when I went to the well to present it. And he prompted me and helped me with the bill. So I've always had a pretty special place in my heart for Denmark Groover. Right. And then I, I think uh, I found out that he'd flown with the Black Sheep Squadron in World War II, and it made me admire him even more. Well, during your terms in the uh, legislature, you became progressively active in the uh, growth of the Georgia Republican Party. Now, tell us about that. That came about quite by accident and came about as a result of a moment of irritation. In my second term, there was a, there was a conference committee formed. I've forgotten why, but the speaker formed a conference committee to meet with uh, uh, some members of the Senate to discuss this issue. And one of the members of the Black Caucus, a lady named Cynthia McKinney, stood up and said, Mr. Speaker, would it be all right? Uh, and Tom Murphy was our speaker. He said, would it be all right if we had a member of the Black Caucus on that conference committee? And he said, yes, as long as I'm Speaker of this House, each and every one has an equal opportunity. So we had a very irreverent lady legislator, a Republican from Savannah, Georgia, named Ann Mueller. Ann Mueller stood up and said, Mr. Speaker, if that's so, what's the possibility of Republican being on that conference committee? And the Speaker had this typical cigar in his mouth and he started chewing on it and he got red in the face and he couldn't talk, he was so angry. He backed off, walked away from the podium, came back when he could get his voice and say, the chances are, Mrs. Mueller, slim and none as long as I'm Speaker of this House. So that's why I spent my 12 years recruiting and training Republicans. I didn't think that was right, Bob. It, it took, I took offense at my old coach's sense of fair play and the things that I learned in sports. And if, if that hadn't happened, I probably would have just served my 12 years like anybody else. But that irritated me, and I, at the first caucus meeting, I said, folks, we're wasting our time. We're not legislators. We're not getting our bills out of committee. We're not even getting the bills heard. Let's spend our time re electing Republicans. Uh, one or two took me up on it and helped me, but I started that day. I started the day he said that. I started talking to fellow uh, 
Democrats who were conservative about switching parties. And I got two or three. They didn't do it right away. They had to think about it a term or two. But, uh, and they were in districts that were kind of split between Republican and Democrat, and they could do it. And they came with us. And then I started recruiting uh, candidates, largely through my old Rotary Club contacts and my old sports acquaintance and so forth around state. Uh, I drove all over most of Georgia at my expense. I never drew a dime for my efforts. Uh, and we were able to we were able to move forward. It wasn't spectacular, but we gained every year until th after the census in, in 2000. You know that every time there's a census, the districts get redrawn. Mm -hmm. And we got, uh, we jumped 14 mm -hmm. the first year, and then I think we jumped 10 or 11 the, the next uh, cycle, uh, and only a handful the next cycle, and then we actually lost one at that, at that point where we got up to 79 from 35. We started with 35. We got up to 79 and, and then we lost one. And I was into my 12th year at, at that point and I decided that that was long enough. I tend to do things for 10, 12 years and get interested in something else. And so uh, I, was, I was ready to quit and I decided to quit. I'd already told the members of my caucus I was going to quit. Uh, the redistricting actually drew me out. Uh, they drew, I live in Cherokee County, and there was this little finger of land that came over to my house at Fall Ground and wrapped around me and went back to Forsyth County. So I was in, I was in Forsyth County in the district. But that was all right. I had, I had already decided uh, not to run again. And, I, one of our last caucus meeting, a little interesting a little story, uh, I said to the folks in our caucus, I was chairman of the caucus at that point, and I said, I want to tell you all, all something very important, and I want you to remember it. We're going to be a majority here very shortly, with maybe one more election cycle. We might make it in one more election cycle. And I said, when we do. I will not be here, but I want to warn you that I'll be watching, and I don't want to hear about this business of not hearing the Democratic bills and not treating them fairly. I don't want to start raping and pillaging just because you're in a majority. And one young legislator in the back row raised his hand and he said, Coach, he said, could we rape and pillage just a little bit? He, he, he had waited a long time <laughs> and, and had a lot of, had a lot of uh, uh, antagonism in his crawl, I guess. The speaker is this... about reapportionment. <clears throat> reapportionment, as you said, is required after every, since every 10 years. Right. It seems that the party in power has been able to gerrymander districts to where that it, is there a better way well, I, I hope there is uh, because it's, it's not right the way it is now. That's, that's wrong. Uh, I would hope that it could be done by the Federals. I'm a states rights man all the way, but I think it needs to be done by the, by the federal government. Perhaps the Department of Justice uh, would, would draw the maps. And I told one young man that was running for Congress lately, originally I, I asked him how far right he was. He's a Republican. And as I've told you earlier, I think the far right extreme group is killing our party, and I don't approve of it. Uh, so I ask each one of them where they stand, and uh, I, I told him that I, I didn't, didn't want to go with somebody that was an extremist either, either way. But I'm kind of stuck here. Let's go 1960. Four, very important year in Georgia for the Republican Party. Yeah. You had Coldwater and you had Congressman Calloway, who was the first Republican elected to Congress in Georgia since, you know, yeah. when. Uh, did that, didn't that lend great impetus to the party? I think it did. I think it did. The, the handful of people 
uh, you know, that were Republicans. And there was only a handful of people. People like Richard Russell, Sam Nunn, and the old-time conservative uh, Democrats would be Republicans today in my judgment. Zell Miller, I think Governor Miller, a person that I admire a great deal. I, I don't know for sure. I don't know what he would say about me saying this, but I believe he would be a Republican if he was running uh, in, in the today's environment. Uh, but at any rate, I think Callaway, and Callaway didn't just serve and quit. He kept active and kept promoting the, uh, the college, and I mean, the, uh, the party. Uh, and of course, Barry Goldwater, uh, uh, he, he engendered a lot of enthusiasm from those who were physically conservative, like myself. Uh, and that's my, probably my primary reason for being a Republican. I'm a physical conservative. Uh, but he got beat very badly, if you remember, in a, almost a landslide. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, he still had a, a positive effect. I think you're right. Yes. And then uh, 1966, uh, Callaway actually won the election for governor, but was never inaugurated because uh, of the majority rule business. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that county unit rule. Right. The yeah. the the uh, third party movement on the part of yeah. Governor yeah. Arnold. I, I think you talk about uh, drawing the districts. I told this young man that was running for Congress. I thought that everything could be solved as far as the unity between the two parties and the people working together in a bipartisan way, if they would draw all districts, 50 percent Republican, 50 percent Democrat. Let everybody run in them. If you'll notice, the ones that come from that kind of district, they're much more bipartisan. At the state level, you'll, you'll see it at state level and you'll see it at the federal level. I don't think that'll ever happen, but I think that would solve a lot of problems as far as people working together. 2002, the takeover year, elected a Republican governor. Two years later, had a majority in the House and the Senate. Have things worked well, do you think? I was very disappointed <clears throat> early on uh, with the way everything went. It seemed like uh, there were just as many pork barrel projects and there was just as much discourtesy from the ruling party to the one that was in the minority. Uh, I have been I've been quite pleased with the leadership of David Ralston uh, in the in the speaker's office. At this at this point in time, the people there tell me that he allows everybody to have a voice and have their bills heard. So I'm fairly happy with it right now. But uh, I was pretty embarrassed for a while there. They didn't they didn't uh, they didn't really listen to me when I asked them not to rape and pillage. It was a there was a lot of that going on. Uh, uh, do you th what do you think of the modern Tea Party? Uh, I'm very disappointed. I, th I think that the modern Tea Party is uh, killing our Republican Party and the uh, basic philosophy that most conservatives stand for. They are so interested in social issues that they neglect to put any emphasis on the fact that we have people who need to make a better living in this country and the economy needs to work better. We need to keep community banks alive and well instead of eliminating them. Uh, I, I, I think that, that the Tea Party doesn't do a good job of that and I'm happy to note that in this particular year of 2014 so far, they have not done well in the Republican primaries. They've been backed strongly by Tea Party money and Tea Party uh, ads on television, but they have not won uh, any races that I'm aware of. They, they might have won one, but I don't think they've won many. Do you think we'll see the day when the Tea Party comes back to the regular Republican Party? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, you know, somebody said, what this country needs is another good depression. 
I certainly don't subscribe to that because I lived through one and I presume you caught the tail end of the depression. So I don't, I don't, I think that's pretty strong medicine to cure what's wrong with people getting along. But you know, it was a time when everybody had to pull together. It was, it was mandatory. Uh, you, you, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't be too antagonistic because everybody had to pull together just to make a living and to survive. Uh, I'm not sure that that's not needed now in, uh, in politics. Uh, we have the extreme liberals on one side and the extreme Republican Tea Party on the other side, and the majority of the people are in the middle, 60%, but they're, they're swayed too much by the, the extremes in, in, in both parties. Uh, it, I think there are many people, and I'm one of them, who would like to see a strong independent party develop. But unfortunately, you can't get elected if you run as an independent, and if you vote for an independent, your vote is wasted, so I don't think that will happen. I don't know which way it's gonna go, Bob. Mm -hmm. But you do think we need some change. I do indeed. Okay, now let's see, after your service in the uh, legislature, you became a member of the Board of Transportation. Well, I went first to the state uh, school board. Oh, uh, good. Governor Perdue appointed me to the state school board, and I only served one year there. Uh, at the time that I was there, the state school superintendent was a lady who is no longer there, uh, uh, Kathy Cox. And at that time, uh, the state school board was kind of a rubber stamp for the staff. Uh, it, was, it was a weak organization, and I, I just couldn't see going two days a month, every month, and wasting my time. So I, there was no voice there. The only thing I really pushed while I was on the state school board was uh, physical activity for youngsters in grades one through eight, 30 minutes a day of physical activity. I got the American Heart Association and a number of organizations to back me, and we presented that, and it went absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so much of our time was spent on what is is. Remember the famous line, what, what is is? That was the way we were spending our time. So I resigned from that board and ran for the State Department of Transportation and, and won. Good. Well, we have transportation problems out here. We have, we have lots of them. If you've driven to Atlanta recently up and down Highway 75, uh, but there's also a lot of problem on the uh, tributary roads that, are, that uh, people would take. They would take those tributary roads in, in many cases if they were a little bit better. But some things, some, same, some things have happened that helped a little bit. It's, it's like taking aspirin for pneumonia, but uh, they've helped some. My push when I was on the board was for private financing of toll roads. Uh, I had been approached by a company in Spain that would underwrite uh, toll roads on the major Atlanta expressways, uh, but we would have to give them 30-year uh, 30 30 -year options on, on that right-of-way and I couldn't get the board to go along with me, and they may have been right, I don't know. We still don't know, I didn't know for sure, but I thought that that would, the folks who needed to get somewhere could, could pay and get in a, a toll lane would do so. Uh, that, was, that was my primary hope for the congestion in Atlanta. We have, added these monitoring signals on the ramps to monitor the way that people enter and exit, and I think that's helped a, a good bit. Uh, simply synchronizing red lights, we found that uh, uh, if you synchronize the red lights uh, so that people didn't have to stop at every one of them, that you could move traffic about 26% better than otherwise. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that many of the small towns in, in Georgia you know, the moderate-sized towns, Valdosta, Thomasville, Jaspers, those types of towns, they've all synchronized their lights a whole lot better, and that moves traffic a little better.
I recently read where the figure that it will cost the city of Atlanta to upgrade its infrastructure is one billion dollars. Where is that money going to come from? It's got to come from the people. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> you know, that government money doesn't exist. <laughs> that, that government money comes from us. <laughs> and so it's got to come from that government after they collect it from the people. And, and what form that would be, I don't, I don't know. We have all sorts of taxes, uh, special SPLOS taxes and uh, various tax divisions developed in cities, uh, allocated tax districts. Uh, I would say that the people of Atlanta could probably have a, have a good right to say everybody in Georgia ought to help with it, who, though at least those of us who visit Atlanta a lot, I don't think that'll play well with the people in my district <laughs> up here in North Georgia. But uh, I, I think that would be f a fair posture. If I were in their shoes, I would probably uh, put out that uh, posture. What is your current take on the state of the state of Georgia? Well, I think the state's still in good shape. State balances its budget every year. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the feds did that? I, I, I worry about uh, having to report to somebody in China on what I'm, what I'm doing because, you know, China could, could own the United States most any time they wanted to. Uh, I don't, that doesn't, doesn't satisfy my pride. I have a lot of pride in our country. I didn't tell you this earlier, but I had five brothers in World War II and lost one of them. And then I served in the Korean War, an easy job as I told you, but uh, I wear this pin not to, as a symbol that I'm one of those mean far right Republicans, which I think many people look at it and they kind of snigger because I wear a flag, but that, that is my five brothers flag. I wear it every day. Anytime I have a coat on you, you will see it. And it's because of them. What is gumption? <laughs> gumption, gumption is sort of something you probably grew up with also. Uh, it's, it's the ability to make do. Uh, my, we had a wood stove when I was growing up. Uh, my mother cooked on a wood stove and the, the firewood for the firebox of the stove had to be cut just a certain length and just right. She'd send you back, if you went to the wood pile to bring in wood for the stove, it had to be just right. And one time the, the handle broke on the ax. I came in and I said, Mama, the handle broke on the ax. I, I can't finish my job. She said, well, if you got any gumption, you go back out there and you cut a little limb off of a tree and you skin the bark back off of it and trim it a little bit and stick it in that ax and you finish the job you started. <laughs> That's gumption. And so she used that word so much I sort of grew up with it and uh, uh, I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to remember it when times were bad and I felt like there was no way to turn. Uh, I tried to remember what my mama said. <clears throat> and I might tell you, I might say this. Uh, my, my mother raised me. My daddy was gone. He deserted the family when I was in about the second grade. Uh, I never, my mother raised the, the remaining group that was at home by herself, selling vegetables and eggs at the curb market in Valdosta. So I'm very proud to say I'm a mama's boy. If anybody wants to call me a mama's boy, they're welcome to do so because that farm lady raised all of the children. Two children didn't survive uh, their young years. The, ten, the other 10, though, she raised almost single-handedly, gave each one a chance to go to college, went to every PTA meeting that they ever had for about 30 years at Clydeville. So that's where I got the gumption from, and I still try to live with it, Bob. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, 
turn now a little bit about your career again. Uh, you've had a distinguished career, career in those various fields that we've talked about, but if you look back over that career, do you think there's anything you might have done differently? Are you, are you speaking about the time I spent in politics? Yes. Yeah. I would have started recruiting the first year I was there instead of the second year. Uh, I think uh, that's about the only thing I can think of. I would have. I still enjoyed <clears throat> my old friends in the Democratic Party. Uh, Bill Cummins was, you know, he, I coached at Rock Mart, his hometown, and he came to all of our games. He'd graduated the year before. Nathan Dean, who was in the Senate, uh, played quarterback. He was second string quarterback for our state championship team at Rock Mart. And so I still enjoyed the friendship of, of my real good old Democratic friends. But I noticed early on, if they would be talking to me in a group and the speaker would walk up on the far side of the room, they would sort of slip away from me. And it took me a while to figure out that they did, the speaker did not want to see them talking to me. <laughs> so that, those kinds of things made me, made me put my efforts. Do you think that was because you were doing such a good job of recruiting for the Republican Party? Uh, it might have been. See, I sort of lived in a, in a fool's paradise. I thought nobody knew what I was doing for a while. <laughs> you told me earlier that everybody knew what I was doing. I didn't know that. So actually, it's, it's, when I reflect on it, the fact that they knew what I was doing, they treated me extremely well. <laughs> Let's talk a minute about Senator Coverdale. You were a great friend of Senator Coverdale's. Uh, tell us about him. Well, C Coverdale and I were, were not uh, close friends. Uh, we were contemporaries, uh, and I admired him tremendously. We were friends, political friends, you know. Uh, Paul was very academic. He, uh, he developed the Coverdale Institute that uh, Still, still functions today. It's a, it's a Republican uh, institute, and of course, we named the legislative office building down there for him. He, he was a consummate legislator, if, uh, and I did not serve with him. But uh, everybody tells me that he studied every bill. He knew every bill that came in. He was like Denmark Groover. We were talking about him early. Denmark got there real early in the morning and studied every bill. And Paul was that type of a legislator. And I have no doubt, but he did the same thing when he was in the Senate. He was, he was very academic and easy, and easy to deal with. He wasn't hard-nosed one way or the other. He was very easy to deal with, very likable fellow. What sort of relationship did you have with the governors with whom you <clears throat> served? Actually, I have had a very gracious and pleasant uh, relationship with the two Democratic governors. Uh, I had a little difficulty getting to know our first Republican governor, but I finally did, and we, we became f friends at a certain level. Uh, but uh, Governor Miller and Governor Roy Barnes both treated me extremely well. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I admired both of them then and I do today. Okay. What, what, of, uh, what did you do that made you most proud as a member of the House of Representatives? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, uh, I'm proud of the issues that I, that I fought for, the zero-based budgeting and the tort reform. <clears throat> but I guess I'm the most proud of, of the, my work in trying to recruit and train candidates and bring in young people, <clears throat> leaders in the communities into the House. Uh, <clears throat> I think there might have been a time when people would come and see it as sort of a vacation from the small hometown they came with and uh, enjoy life in Atlanta for a couple of years. But uh, we were seeking and looking for uh, young, well-educated, men who would come 
and uh, take an academic approach to it and serve in the very best fashion they could do. And, and we found a number of them. I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the number of them that came in. But I, I guess that I'm most proud of that work. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a Lone Ranger type of job. Steve Stansel kind of assigned me to that task. He was a, he was a minority leader, and so he 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 was a really close friend of mine. He assigned me to that task and uh, encouraged me. And there were there were a few others, but basically it was kind of a Lone Ranger effort. Mm -hmm. Got a bucket list. <laughs> well, if you're expecting me to say that I'm ready to stop, jump out of an airplane like George Bush next year, that's, that's not on my bucket. That's not on my bucket list. Well, I don't know that I'll ever get this done, Bob. I, I uh, wrote five books, as you know, and I, when I was in high school coaching, I wrote for magazines, uh, coaching magazines, the old Dwight Keith's old scholastic coach used to run my articles once in a while. Uh, but I, I would I would I think maybe that I have another book in me that's of a different different nature and uh, I I hope to get down to that. It's gonna take discipline. It takes a lot of discipline to produce a manuscript. And, uh, that's one thing I'd like to do. If I if I had both knees still working well <clears throat> I would love to play tennis tournaments every weekend, <clears throat> but I lost my knees when I was in my 60s, and now I have a new hip, so I can't do that. But I, and I hope to, I hope on my bucket list that uh, I can have one more service in some fashion that's a real contribution to the community, whether it's uh, working with the Boys and Girls Club, or I would. I would probably be more comfortable with something in recreation for disadvantaged children or coaching some way. I have a strong desire to get involved in that and I've just gotten free of, of my other responsibilities. I'm, I'm sort of casting around. I'm a new, re I'm a new retiree at 86. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Is there anything that we failed to mention that you would like to uh, yeah, folks to yeah, know about you? Yeah, you, you didn't say that we used to play basketball against each other. We've done that. <laughs> We've done that. We have. Yeah, and I yeah. think you... You were a great player. You played at Young Harris with uh, Zell Miller, I believe. Oh, yeah. Uh, you were Harris. you were the star, and, and as, Zell, as Zell tells it, he was a warm-up guy and a, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. a bench sitter. Yeah. But he... Yeah, you didn't mention that. And those were great. Those were some great years, Bob. And uh, I'm proud you were you were a good competitor. I enjoyed it, and I'm glad we mentioned that right at the end here. Good. Well, you were a good player, and I've always admired your coaching ability, and your political ability, and you as a person. Uh, you you've been a great asset. Well, I think that's the most important. And thank you more for that than anything else. <laughs> you've been a great asset to the state of Georgia. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Garland Penholster. <laughs>